Hi, Dr. P here. And this is the first video I've made since my recent triple bypass, so we'll see how it goes. What I want to talk about are nine important techniques that have been developed since 1959 in tabletop war game design, although much of it applies to computers as well. So, this is about conflict games of maneuver or placement in geospatial relationships, which we tend to call war games. These are older style games and they're now displaced in large part by games without these characteristics, games that are more like puzzles or multiplayer solitaire parallel competitions. The early games that I'm talking about are ones that derived kind of naturally from classic games like chess, checkers, go, even tic-tac-toe. And we then had, mostly in 1959, a series of early war games like Broadsides, Conflict, Risk, Diplomacy. Of course, Stratego is much older than that. These games themselves introduced many innovations, such as simultaneous movement in a form of hidden identity. War games became the hobby of baby boomers. Now keep in mind this is kind of strange because war and games are near opposites. War is very uncertain, dirty, awful, horrible, you know, quote, war is hell, unquote. Games aren't dirty or awful. Um, they're supposed to be fun. And hobby game players who seek mastery of a game which was common at that time, want to feel that they're in control of what happens, which is the exact opposite of what happens in warfare. Some uncertainty is necessary in games to avoid a puzzle, although we have some classic games such as chess and checkers that are puzzles but too complex for humans to solve, but not nearly the scale of uncertainty that characterizes real warfare. Here are the nine improvements. I'm going to talk about each one in turn. First is the Combat's Results Table, or CRT, developed by Avalon Hill and specifically Charles S. Roberts. Instead of rolling lots of dice or using a deterministic, that is, no chance combat method, Avalon Hill introduced the die roll CRT. This lets you take risks, but the better your odds, the more likely you were to succeed. It combined the realism of war, a lot of uncertainty, with enough organization or control to make for a good game. And Avalon Hill made many, many games with CRTs. Another innovation was hexes, that is to say, hexagonal grids. War games before tended to have boards of squares or of areas. Now squares, unfortunately, introduced highly skewed movement. It's 1.41 diagonally to 1 orthogonally, orthogonal being up, down, and sideways. A few games counted 1.5 for diagonal, most did not. Some games prohibited diagonal movement, leaving just four choices. Also, the eight squares around a square can be awkward to see, especially if you're supposed to go around it. Hexes, which are six-sided, provide less distortion and boards tend to have more spaces and six directions of movement. Hexes themselves are not without distortion, but much less. Another innovation was zones of control. This enables a unit to exert influence on adjacent hexes, not just on its own hex. It helps cope with a larger number of spaces. It helps prevent unrealistic penetration of lines of defense, and it avoids the crowding of games like Stratego. Steps for strength reduction. The steps would be on the opposite side of a flat piece, so on one side it would give the strength and, and movement and so on of a piece, and on the other side the reduced strength and movement. This removed the all or nothing aspect of combat. A piece when hit is turned over to its second weaker side, just as a unit in war gets weaker as it is hit. 
though of course if it's hit hard enough it may be wiped out even if it's on its good side to start with. This allows for fewer units overall and makes for some interesting choices, interesting decisions by the players. Hidden identity. That is, in this case, turning pieces face down with colored backs to show which side is which. And possibly you can have some uh, decoys, which is to say a piece with nothing on the identity side. The Stratego method is actually easier to use, but it's much more expensive to produce and is only for two-player or two-sided games. Face down is fiddly, but it still works for stacks of pieces or for games with more than two players, which Stratego doesn't do. Now, blocks for hidden ID and hidden strength and steps. And perhaps this is why block games are very popular nowadays. Wooden blocks with stickers on them to show the identity. And by rotating the block, you can have up to four levels or steps of strength. And only the owning player can see this information ordinarily. Now, unfortunately, this technique is limited primarily to two or three player games. With four, it's too easy to see other players' information unless you use a special piece holder like the Towers in Conquest Stratego, which is a relatively new game. Different sizes and shapes of blocks can differentiate land, sea, air units, or pikemen versus cavalry, and so on. There's an example of blocks from a well-known block game. Chit activation. Players pull chits from a cup to determine which of their units can act and in what order. This makes the game perhaps more realistic because it takes a lot of control away from the, the player. But as a game player, I don't care for the idea because it limits what you can choose to do by taking away options, not by limiting the number of options. I'd much rather have few options and have to pick the best ones rather than just be faced with not being able to do a lot of things. Card-driven games can also make the game more realistic, but sometimes take choices away. For example, you might want to attack on the right flank. But if you don't have a card that lets you do that, you can't do it. The cards introduce flavor into the game, but often the flavor and the activity are unconnected. Card-driven games are very popular, but again, I don't like them because they take choices away. Now, the last of these is alternating movement attack by unit, rather than turn by turn for a lot of pieces, which is the post-1959 standard method. So, in the early Avalon Hill games, you would move all your pieces, then you would attack, then the other player would move all their pieces, then they would attack, and so forth. In a way, this alternating movement attack by unit is a reversion to Stratego, but with a very important exception. Uh, you can extend this only to attack. It can also extend to movement, combination of movement and attack. So in your turn you might move a unit or have a unit attack or perhaps both. Or this might be done in groups of units. But no unit can move or attack more than once until the turn ends. This takes more time to play, but it's also much closer to reality. It also keeps both players completely engaged in what's happening, rather than one waiting for the other to complete their turn with numerous pieces. It's a two-player method, it seems to me, not multiplayer. No doubt there are other, quote, new, unquote, techniques I haven't listed, nor are these confined to tabletop games, of course. Thanks for listening.